All right, let's go ahead and um, get this started Good. this afternoon. He's got the little notebook too. Wow. So thanks again for coming back uh, to participate in our seminar <laughs> seminar series that we're providing uh, throughout this fall. And I hope all of you had a chance to go to the um, Empowering Teaching Excellence workshop or our conference um, right at the first of the year. And that now that your classes are underway, you can kind of start to settle in and, and start developing some new habits and strategies. Um, so uh, today we um, are going to have uh, some presentations and I'll introduce those two in a moment. But um, I'd like to give just kind of a quick plug for our next uh, seminar series that we will have on October 19th and we'll broadcast it out again and of course have it here in the library. And that will be uh, on meeting the challenge of understanding and addressing distance education with Utah Native American communities. Uh, we will have some faculty um, joining us in from our Blanding campus, USU Eastern, uh, Guy Denton, Rachel Walton, uh, Marilyn Kutch, uh, Garth Wilson, and Jan Thornton. Um, I think it'll be a very nice presentation, and they've been uh, more than willing and excited to provide this for us. So that will be on October 19th, again at uh, 3.30 to 4.30, same time as we have this one today. Um, another quick plug that I'd like to provide is um, our testing center here on the Logan campus is now um, just about open. So it, there are, in the testing center, if you're not aware and haven't seen the construction, it's just here on the south side of the library. And um, you can go through and uh, there are three open houses that are next week on Tuesday, September 27th from 10 to 4, so for the most part of the day. Then on Wednesday, the 28th from 2 to 8 p.m., and on um, the Thursday, the 29th, from 10 to 4 p.m. So go take some time to go over there and, and look at the testing center, see if there's some services that are available for your classes and your students. Um, they're already registering or, or, or scheduling uh, tests and quizzes um, with students and for different courses. And in addition to that, there are also some uh, virtual proctoring that is available or, or testing, virtual proctoring for testing. Um, out for any of our regional campuses and online courses. So you can talk to Chris Daly if you have any questions about that. So uh, on today, we are uh, going to have a presentation by Dr. Dan McInerney and uh, Dr. Norm Jones, um, out of the, the professors of history. And I, I would like to just kind of get a quick introduction of how I, I really met these two and got to know them. Of course, I've known them here at the university and, and worked with them in passing uh, every now and then we would have meetings. But it was last year, um, we happened to be on the same flight going to the same conference unbeknownst to each other. And um, we ended out in the Midwest at this very cold conference and it, it was fascinating and they, they may talk a little bit about that today of, of the, the gen ed requirements and outcomes that were discussed at the conference. But um, at that time, I was actually taking a class and I was, I was learning a bit of history about Bobby Kennedy. And that evening, they invited me to have dinner with them. And I've never had dinner with historians before. So this was, this was exciting. And I was, had just had this fantastic discussion about Bobby Kennedy. And so when I sat down, I was there next to, to Dan, and I said, I'm curious, what would have happened if Bobby had not been assassinated had he not died. And he looked at me, I mean, it was as stern as a father could look at the, <laughs> his son. And he goes, you never ask a historian what would have happened. <laughs> what did happen is what I'll share with you. And it was a wonderful, wonderful conversation. So with that, um, I'd like to turn the time over to both of them for this today's uh, presentation and workshop. So this will be somewhat of a, a working session and you should walk away with, um, I guess, some rubrics of sorts. So, or some strategies. Thanks very much for, for inviting us to be here. <laughs> uh, again, I'm Dan McInerney from the History Department. And uh, I divide my academic life into two periods, uh, BR and PR, before rubrics and post rubrics. And I wouldn't be up here unless I, I could promise you that I've seen just a major practical difference in my life using these small devices. And this is coming from a guy who maybe five years ago didn't even know 
what the hell a rubric was. Uh, it, was it was my department head at the time, Norm Jones, who said, yeah, you've been doing this all along. Don't you have some kind of sheet you've written up where you've collected the kind of comments you write again and again and again on essay exams? And instead of, instead of driving yourself nuts with these comments, you've decided to collect the wording, the language that talks about what's strong on an essay, what's weak on an essay, and giving this to students in advance, rather than waiting until they get their exams evaluated and returned. And I said, that's a rubric? And Norm said, yeah, that's exactly it. And then he sent me away to a to rubric camp. Uh, and it was delightful, because it, it was in Portland, Oregon. And it was sponsored by a group called the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And they've, at that time and since, they've provided enormous assistance to professors in a wide range of disciplines to help develop these evaluation guides that are of service to us as faculty, that are of service to our students as learners. And what I've heard more and more as I've used these in classes, the rubrics are of such great service to the graduate assistants who help us in our classes with evaluations of student work. And you know, you may find yourself in this kind of position with, this, with the kind of problems and complaints that this slide outlines. Uh, just the frustration of looking at student work and saying to yourself, my goodness, it's the same mistake over and over again, that you're writing the same comments on every page, uh, that, they, that students just don't seem to get it. I've outlined an assignment or an exercise, and it's just one problem after another that's being repeated. And by the end of several days of grading, you're also, I think many of you are thinking to yourselves, how do I, how do I grade this work on an even basis? How do I keep some kind of steady scale in my mind of what is strong and what is weak? I want to promise you that the development of rubrics for your course developed in line with your understanding of disciplinary needs the curriculum desires and intentions of your program, and as Norm will explain, the larger uh, curriculum goals, if you happen to be teaching a survey in the gen ed program, I think all of these issues are answered to a great extent by the development of rubrics for your classes. It's just a grading guide. That's all it is. We're an evaluation guide. And it's designed both for you as an instructor and for your students. And I, I should add here again, your graduate assistants if you've been assigned any. And this is the question that the rubric is trying to answer for all of these parties. Knowing what assignment I'm going to give, how do I evaluate the student's work? What do I expect them to accomplish? And I think most importantly for all of us, what are the components of a grade that we can outline for our students? I suspect that many of us come with suspicions about large standardized exams uh, that are offered for our students that supposedly reveal their level of learning. And when students end this, end this work, which is usually low stakes for them because the, the standardized exams they take have nothing to do with their actual courses, students wind up with a number. And we can easily ask ourselves, what the heck does that number mean? If they get a 22 on this thing, what does that tell us about their learning? Are we doing the same thing when we evaluate student work and return it, and there's a number that we have on the paper, a, a number that may be a 62 or an 81? And that's, there's little more than that that we're providing as an explanation of the components of a grade. What I like about the rubrics is that it's reminding students again and again, a numerical grade or a letter grade is the reflection of our consideration, deep disciplinary consideration of a variety of components. And the rubric can lay this out for everyone, instructors, students, and graduate assistants. What kind of achievement do you expect to find? Uh, this came up in this morning's general education meeting in the university. Uh, if you've got a survey class, 
and you know most of those students are freshmen, and you know something else. They're non-majors in your field. What is the level of achievement you expect in certain skills and proficiencies among those students? And again, what receives an A, a C, an F, whatever you finally give to these students as an evaluation of their work in the course. The rubric is an attempt to clarify all this, and I'd actually use another word. The rubric is an attempt to demystify this whole process for students, and for instructors, and for graduate assistants. Um, I've given you an example of one that I use in my survey course. I've got about 205 students in a uh, US survey course that's part of the Gen Ed program, and it's part of our curriculum for majors as well, one and the same time. And a, a rubric is composed, it basically has two parts. You deciding what should be the components of a grade. You know, as I've said here, these categories of knowledge, thinking, skills, in your partic particular discipline. And across the page, explaining to students what levels of mastery it mean. What does an A mean if I'm asking them to develop their historical knowledge? Or what does a C mean? or an F mean? Uh, what does strong performance, poor performance, or weak performance mean? Rather than just giving numbers and letters to this, I try to spell it out in some kind of language that's accessible to the students themselves. For us, I think this is the key to all of uh, the work on rubrics. It's an attempt to make what is implicit in our courses explicit for students and our graduate assistants. Clarifying what we want to accomplish and how we make these abstract points more concrete for our students. Linking the goals we have for our classes, and this is something Norm will talk about in a little while, the goals that we personally establish within the courses to which we've been assigned with the larger curricular goals that we have in our department, and with programs like general education. Uh, part of the process of dealing with rubrics successfully <clears throat> is understanding that we're all moving away from a world focused on my course as if it's a piece of personal property to think about our curriculum and, and imagining yourself as a kind of Russian nesting doll where at one point, you know, you're folk, look, you're responsible for the courses you've been assigned. You're the instructor of record. And you know, your focus remains on that day after day, but that course is undoubtedly part of a larger disciplinary curriculum, a major. And perhaps, for many of us, that course at the same time fulfills another category, a program set of categories or an institutional mission. And think of yourself as a Russian nesting doll occupying all these spaces at once. How do you make clear to yourself first and then to your students how your course answers all of those uh, expectations to make all of this clear, connected, and concrete. What I find most helpful about the, uh, about the rubrics is to give me some kind of steadiness and consistency in my grading. If I'm going nuts looking at a bunch of papers, uh, it gives me a chance to step back at each individual evaluation and remind myself, this is what I have told students in advance I expect. And it helps me do, I think, do a much better job of giving fair, equitable, consistent evaluation of student work. And I wind up spending less time pointing out these problems that are constantly recurring. Uh, for example, on that rubric you have in front of you, I can easily just circle a problem that I see on a paper. And the reason I can do that easily is because this is coming from my own record of the kinds of comments I've made on papers in the past. It's one way for you just to you know, develop ownership of this yourself. What's been your experience in evaluating papers? Just take stock of that. And perhaps just start writing down for yourself what are the recurring comments you're making for strong and for weak papers. Uh, the other advantage to me, as I'm going through a stack of papers and just flipping through these rubrics, I can start to easily tell which of these on this, on this sheet, five components of a grade, 
where students need the most help and where they seem to be doing pretty fine. I can make a mid-course correction, in other <coughs> words, and adjust what I'm doing in the class to answer the most important and urgent needs of students. <clears throat> Maybe this will come up in another ETE presentation later in the year. What, uh, what John and Travis and others have explained to us in the history department is that rubrics are, the, are a good start for developing a very rich assessment program, not only for your course, but for your department or your college. Uh, but I won't go into this now. We're, we're experimenting with this in the history department. Let's just say that the university has, um, the, adverse, the university is taking on uh, more components of our Canvas course management system, and there are some surprises in there that, are, that may be difficult to find, but they, they involve very clear and very meaningful assessment outcomes that uh, would be helpful for any department or college to report in January when Northwest decides to visit us uh, on an accreditation visit. Uh, it's actually pretty exciting and, and the thing I can promise faculty, it doesn't require you to do two kinds of evaluation. One for individual students and one for an assessment program. If you do one evaluation individually for students in your class and do it well, that work is also going to create meaningful assessment for your curriculum as a whole and maybe for entire programs like general. But more about that, I think, at a, at a, later, at a later workshop. What's in it for students with rubrics? And this is what students have told me. Because uh, when I started using these, I, I pleaded with students, give me your response to this. Should I continue using it? And students in the surveys, mainly non-majors, were constantly telling me, keep this up. This is what I need. Because it's ending this frustrating guessing game of what's on professor's mind. I'm trying to make the implicit explicit. And it's demonstrating to students that when I give a grade, it's not in it's not arbitrary, and it means more than a number or a letter. That there are many components that are being measured, and they can see the difference. Folks, let me tell you quite quickly, the major change I've seen before using rubrics and after. Before using rubrics, office hours were a nightmare after an exam. And the worst would be a furious student who comes in, slams a paper down in front of me and says, no one has ever given me anything less than a C minus in my entire life. Where does this D come from? And expressing just complete disbelief that someone could evaluate their work at that lower level. That's never happened after I've used rubrics. Here's the typical office visit now. Students take an exam, hand in a paper, come in to talk about it, and this is the, this is the vocabulary they're using. I didn't do as well as I hoped I would. I see that I actually did well on these three parts of my grade, but on these two parts, I need a lot of help. What kind of advice can you give me to do better on those two sections? And I always ask faculty a simple question. Isn't that the office hour you dream of? I, honest to God, I don't know what difference has been made in all of this other than using a rubric. And students looking at it carefully. Not just seeing a number or a letter, but seeing, I did very well here, but boy, I have a problem in this area. Um, we're breaking down their tasks into these, into these component parts. That's always a helpful way for students to understand work within a discipline, especially a discipline with which they are not familiar. And it's pinpointing these areas where they need assistance. And I like this too. And this is going to be available on Canvas in the future, where students are going to be able to toggle between numbers and letters and something called learning mastery, which is giving them the vocabulary to talk about the skills and proficiencies they're developing in our different disciplines. That's very helpful for students to provide a persuasive narrative of their educational experience, whether they're thinking about graduate school or whether they're thinking about employment. 
just having a, an answer to the question. You took history courses. What do you do in history? I think this kind of work helps give students the answer to that question. Where do you start? What kind of language should you use? How do you describe different goals for different courses? This is where Norm's going to take over. And Norm is going to talk about these, uh, these rubrics, not just in one individual course or one individual discipline, but in a wider university level. If I can get all the tech to attach to my tie. That's the hard part right there. Because this is still on. Thanks, John. It's nice to be here. Nice to see so many old friends. Uh, I have a feeling that many of you probably don't need this lecture, but are going to take it back to your departments. And so we're going to talk about this a larger context of both the rubrics. What Dan has been talking about is the context in which the faculty member and the student there it is, okay, <laughs> find the clicker, which the faculty member and the student are engaged in this common learning activity that is clarified through the rubrics. What I want to do is to show you as faculty some of the other ways in which the rubric becomes an extremely useful tool. He talked about the Russian dolls, the nesting dolls. We're going to talk about eggs for a minute. Because anybody who is teaching in the university is teaching inside of a whole series of, of nested dolls. Uh, and we will start with the USU Citizen Scholar degree profile. Do you know we have a degree profile? <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> this, this, this is bad news sometimes when you ask this question and nobody responds. All right, Dan. There we go. Uh, USU's degree profile guarantees that any student who graduates from Utah State without regard to major, will have a certain set of abilities. They will be able to understand and process the processes of acquiring knowledge and information. Every student, reason logically, critically, creatively, and independently, and be able to address problems in a broad context. <laughs> See, Julia's sitting here already worried that she's not delivering all of this in her class. Recognize different ways of thinking, creating, expressing, and communicating through a variety of media. Understand diversity in value systems and cultures in an inter interdependent world. And last but not least, develop capacity for self-assessment and lifelong learning. Uh, there's a whole, it explains this, the degree profile. So if you go to the Gen Ed website and you click on citizen degree profile, it will pull the whole thing up. Uh, but what does this mean? Well, it means that anyone who's teaching anyone is engaged in the process of creating this kind of a student. Because anyone who graduates from the university is expected to have these characteristics. And whether you're doing gen ed or you're teaching your majors or you're teaching ancillary courses that somebody from other majors is taking or it's just, a, you know, you're taking the American Civil War, students are taking that because they like to hear about people getting killed in large numbers. Nonetheless, every course we teach is contributing to the construction of this kind of a student. So that's one egg. That's the university degree. And a degree is bigger than a major. So within the degree, there are majors, minors, and uh, general education. General education then has its own set of course criteria. And those course criteria are asking, remember all those things we were just looking at? In Gen Ed, that's the introduction to most of that stuff. And so general education has its own goals and criteria, uh, which are laid out quite nicely in rubrics. And on one side, it will say a student taking a course in life sciences will know, understand, be able to do these. And we will know at what level they are doing them by looking across the rubric and asking what does proficiency look like in these things. And so if you want to look those up. Those are available on the Gen Ed website as well, right, Lee? <laughs> so the criteria are there. So if you're assigned to teach a Gen Ed course, then you have to ask yourself, am I teaching a course which meets the criteria spelled out by the general education goals which are related to the citizen scholar goals? But then there's the major. All of you are teaching courses in majors. The major has its own particular characteristics because there is a difference between a major in history and a major in art history. 
Uh, what is that difference? If, if, if we sit down together, can we explain to one another whether art history is history? <laughs> uh, we should be able to because every degree has a set of distinct characteristics. Because if you have a degree in that subject, there are certain things that any student with that degree is expected to know, to understand, and be able to do. This egg is the one about how am I preparing majors as majors to complete the thing that makes them worthy of a degree in the major. So we've got the university citizens goals, we have the gen ed goals, we have the major goals. Then we have your goals. Uh, a few of you actually are tenured, so you guys can just take this to the meeting of the next PMP committee you, you have to sit on. But if you're not tenured, this is especially useful. We handed out copies of this. I think there are still some more on the table here. It's a publication that Dan and I recently did uh, that asks you is to be able to explain yourself as a teacher. Now, if you've got to do what we used to call the binders, I know they're electronic now, but you have to build that file that proves that you meet all of the areas of your role statement, and if you, your role statement includes teaching, then this may be useful to you because you need to be able to situate yourself, your own particular courses, inside of these larger goals of the university by asking yourself a set of questions. Here's the basic set. And this is why rubrics can be so useful. Because if you're asking these questions about your courses, you are getting ready to write a rubric. Who takes my course? Now, if you're teaching 10 whatever, right, do you assume that anybody coming into that class has any preparation for doing that class? If you're teaching a 4,000 level course, can you assume something else about the students? So where do the students start? Where does the course start? What's, what's the, if I'm going to say, what must a student in this course show me that they can do? Well, if you already have to ask the question, what can they do when they arrive? Then you're in a position to start building that rubric. Why are they taking the course? If the student is taking the course because they have to have this in order to get into that, that's, that's one kind of expectation. If you think the student's taking the course because they just like it, that would be a different expectation, wouldn't it, in terms of what you're asking them to demonstrate in terms of their proficiency. So you have to ask, what, do, what can I assume about the students who are coming in? And what's the end point? Your rubric is going to say, I want you to show me that I can do these things, and this is how I'm going to evaluate it. So that end point is, at the end of this course, what can the students demonstrate? Uh, and how do they demonstrate it? You look at the gen ed uh, templates, you'll, you'll see this very clearly because it's, they're stated in proficiencies. And a passing proficiency says they can do these things. We used to have one that Harrison used to use that I, I liked a lot, uh, that declared, that said, students who cannot demonstrate these things fall into a column we called incompetent. Uh, he reported that his students didn't like incompetence being a category in the rubric, so we had to change the language, but you can see where we're going with this. We're saying students demonstrate the learning that I'm expecting them to demonstrate by doing this or, or failing to do this. Uh, and lastly, who's the audience for your courses? If you're teaching, I don't know, Math 1050, who's the next audience? Who's the next employer of that student? Okay, nobody knows what Math 1050 is good for. This is, Lee, this is Gen Ed, still got his work cut out for it. <laughs> the course is also called Pre-Calculus Algebra, right? <laughs> so you're assuming a student who's past 1050 can succeed in the first calculus course. That's an audience that you're preparing your students to interact with. So you've got to be able, and your rubric does this, you've got to be able to say, all right, you're the next professor who's receiving my student. This is what this student can do. Here's the demonstration of what this student can do. And this, this is what we like, what's going about with Canvas is eventually we'll be able to physically show. You want to see what they did? You can have a look. It's there. The artifacts of student performance are there. So it's a way of explaining to yourself and to your students what's going on. It allows you to display what your course is about. 
It allows you to ask the questions that lead to assessment, and it allows you to explain how you meet your course goals. Now, if you, you take this set of questions and you say, and who am I as a teacher? It's the same thing. You were hired to do a job. Your job is to teach certain things in a certain program, but those things that you're teaching are leading the student someplace. And you should be able to articulate all of that as you prepare your T&P documentation. So all of these things, the rubric helps the student. It helps your, your graduate assistant. It helps you, but then you use the rubric as this kind of organizing principle where you can demonstrate to your colleagues how your teaching works, where you're situated within the goals of the university, within the ancillary operations your department has, within the major, all of this is a way of articulating who you are as a teacher and showing how your teaching is working. So now I'm going to hand it back to Dan, uh, but keep the, uh, let's see, I'll show you the, keep this one handy because we're going to be doing an exercise that's based on it. The microphone is stuck in my You? Look, I'll be the first to I'll be the first to acknowledge a lot of the stuff can be mind numbing the first time if, if this is for you the first time you're coming across it and maybe it's a bit intimidating. It shouldn't be. Folks, look, all the questions we've talked about resolve themselves into a into a basic issue that all of us have a passionate interest in. And the issue is that it's all about the learning. What do we set up as our goals in the learning we want our students to achieve? And the rubrics help us and our students in a follow-up question. How do we know the students have demonstrated those goals and at what level? That's basically what this is all about. And it's an attempt just to state these concerns as clearly, as concretely, in, in as accessible, accessible an, an effort, a way as possible. And it's always best to think of one of those key questions about your audience in the classroom. Who's in there? What can they understand about all this? Uh, I, I've been beginning my Gen Ed American History Survey class, part of the American Institutions requirement, for the past couple of years. I've begun that class not so much with a broad outline of early American history. I've done it with a broad outline of what Gen Ed is all about. I can't assume that students who come into our university understand the purpose of Gen Ed, especially if they've been pushed by parents, family, friends, to think about college in monetary terms, to focus on a specific discipline and a specific job they have in mind, and to just do as little as possible in other areas of their own learning. And to confront those questions, students with the simple question, why the hell are you doing university work in the United States? Because this is our signature mark in higher education, general education. And trying to explain to students what I hope my course helps them achieve, clarifying transferable skills that they can use in math and biology and engineering and science, whatever, in all the disciplines that I know these students are coming from. It forces me again to take that first step of making the implicit explicit. And I keep stepping back to figure out what might these students not grasp that those of us who have been involved in a culture of academic study for decades just you know, know off the top of our heads. We're so familiar with it. We can't assume that with our students. If you keep in mind this is a focus on their learning, if you keep in mind this question about where your students are coming from, what might be on their mind as they take your course, what their expectations are, and how much help you'll be giving them by clarifying what kinds of exercises you're going to do in this class and how those exercises will be evaluated. I think you're going a long way towards convincing those students you are as dedicated to their learning as I know, as everybody in this room knows you all are, that it's your passion. 
This is what's driving you and brings you to campus every day. Those students, their growth, their learning, and their success. I honestly think these rubrics are a great key to help those students make advances in their learning. The first step in designing any, any rubric, and this is just pretty simple stuff. I apologize if it's at an elementary level for those who are familiar with the whole question of rubrics. Uh, and this is the way I do it as a real nerd with technology. Uh, John knows I've, I've tried to develop web pages by starting on a Word document. It's just, you know, bizarre. But I just have, I don't have many, much talent for other forms, or other kinds of programs. But a rubric is a, great, is a great document to start in Word. Because all you do is go to insert in Word, and then you go to tables, and just set up, well, start by setting up like a seven by seven table. And if there are too many spaces, that's easy to delete. And you can easily add them to. That's step one in this actual product. In a left column uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the rubric, in the, ver in the left vertical column, fill in each cell by asking yourself, what do you want your students to know, understand, and be able to do in your course? And this is going to take a lot of reflection on your part. I I'd suggest something else. It should also take some review on your part of the kinds of outcomes that your department has set up or your discipline has established. What do you want your students to know, understand, and be able to do in your class? In, in the example I gave to you, I'm thinking a survey class, mainly freshmen. Uh, these students are not going to write some original contribution to historical knowledge. And I think that's a pretty fair assessment of where they, their capabilities and the capabilities that they're not going to be able to achieve this first time out. So I broke it down into three categories. The knowledge they achieve, the historical skills they, I want them to master, and the, histor the levels of historical thinking I want them to work on in the class. But that's for history. Uh, every one of you can make this decision in, in your discipline. And in the top row, the horizontal row, uh, just levels of performance. So it looks something like this, the components of a grade and the levels of mastery. Now, uh, you know, I've picked five levels of mastery here. I've actually read some documents that say, no, that's overkill. Just keep it to three. Uh, you know what I like about this? I got five columns. I encourage students to think, if you're conceiving of grades in terms of an A, here's your column a B, a C, a D, an F, and it's easy to start a class by telling a student, your goal is to get an A in this class, God bless you, do all this. And if that performance is weak, there are some points that are not being developed as, or mastered as well, well you may wind up with a B, but here are the reasons why you're getting a B. Step three on these criteria or proficiencies that you're establishing. You can talk about this in so many different ways. Think about the wording that corresponds to the outcomes of your course. And this is going to take reflection on your part. I won't, I'm not going to kid you for a second. This is a time-consuming activity. But once you do it, you can come back to this semester after semester, make some, usually make some minor adjustments and reissue this rubric again and again. And I think you'll find ways of thinking of how to create a rubric for a 1,000 level class and what needs to be added to justify a class that has a 4,000 number in front of it. And that wording should correspond to your disciplinary expectations. Here's the other part of this, folks. If you're like me, maybe 10 years ago, you may have tried to find the most remote place in a faculty department meeting when the subject of assessment or accreditation or accountability came up. And you, like me, you might have said to yourself, you know what, that's somebody else's job, it's not mine. My job is to go in and teach the survey class, to do research, the other parts of your, your performance. 
and you just run away from these other tasks. I got to give you a warning. If you don't do that work, answering questions of accountability, standards of assessment, and accreditation, who will? I'll tell you who will. That vacuum is going to be filled, and it's going to be filled by people who know nothing about your discipline. How comfortable are you going to be in that kind of world where others are defining for you what your discipline means? It got me very nervous when I started to think who might possibly answer these questions about what a history major should accomplish, what it should stand for. And I started to figure out for myself that a mature instructor has got to figure out if we're expected to do research, teaching, and service, there might be a fourth component of our responsibility, and it's advocacy. Advocacy for the disciplines in which we've all been trained and in which we hold a deep and passionate commitment. We ought to take ownership of this. Rubrics are one way of doing this. Clarifying what your goals or outcomes, whatever language you want to use here, clarifying the distinctions in forms of mastery of these outcomes, and helping others in your department if you don't have a very clear set of disciplinary outcomes in your field to fashion these. Because it puts you at the front line of these battles we're all fighting. When people ask, what's it worth to have a history degree? Look, there are probably a lot of people who may ask questions about the value of some majors in the sciences, in technology. Who knows what kind of questions come up? It's up to us to develop the answers to these as the discipline experts. I'm appealing to you on that level and appealing to perhaps your notion of the need to take ownership of these examinations of our work. Uh, wording that corresponds to a college or university program, the better you can frame this so that you're, you're trying to balance out all these other courses and requirements, I think the better both for you and your students and what's even best about, what's best about this, the ability of these rubrics, especially using new features on Canvas that will come into play next year fully, to develop very, very meaningful and rigorous assessment products. You might think this is the last thing in the world you'd ever get involved in, in your teaching and in your disciplinary work. Folks, when you're thinking about what your expectations are for students and the level at which you want, you want those students to achieve those goals, you're this close to doing meaningful assessment. That's going to help you. It's going to help your department. It's going to help the university, especially as we're coming up in an accreditation review. Um, the levels of performance, look, you can see the words I've used, excellent mastery, very good, uh, you know, oh boy, Wait, should you have three or five of these? Um, what's the language you use? You, do you really want to have a column that says incompetent? I, I don't have the heart to do that with students. Um, I just can't bring myself to do that even the real jerks, but, but, um, but think about what you're comfortable with. Uh, here's some other examples of the language that colleagues have used in their rubrics. Mastery, skill, competent, well, that incompetent, yeah, it's kind of, that makes me very nervous. Uh, maybe you need a trigger warning just for that. Um, and the levels of performance, how do you want to lay this out? Mine look like they go from an A to an F. Or do you want to move from the weakest to the strongest? Um, the key, though, is explaining the distinction. I think we all know in our, in our own minds there's got to be some difference between a D work and A level work on a class exercise. But it's up to us individually to define that. And again, I'm pleading with you. You must do this. You don't want others to do it for you. 
this is why you've gone through so much training in your discipline. This is how you want to express your expertise, not just in a class, not just in your important research, in the way you advocate for your class and its purposes. And explaining why you do evaluate some work as poor in a way, hopefully, that students might understand on their own, in a way that might lead that student to come to visit you in your office and ask for some assistance to move that poor evaluation to a much stronger one. Uh, you know, stating what strengths are, stating what kinds of omissions students make, all of this goes into a, a, rubric, a rubric that works well. It's about 4, 4 uh, 20 right now. Um, I think in the original advertising of this, of this workshop, uh, folks were asked to bring a computer or a tablet or something and actually just start building one of these. Here's the great low-tech answer to this. You, you don't need those damn things. You, what you need is a blank piece of paper. You just draw boxes. But the more, the more difficult part of this is the reflection you have to do yourself. And I'm asking you to do this as a discipline expert. What are you setting up as your goals in your class? How clear can you make these goals to your students? Not 10 weeks into a semester, but on day one, in the syllabus. How clear can you make this? Here's what I'm about to do for 15 weeks. I'm glad you're journey, joining me in this journey. You know you're going to be evaluated for your work. I'm going to be evaluated for my work as a teacher, too. We're all under evaluation. I want to lay out for you what I expect for myself, from my TMP committee, from my department head. I want to have a sense of what kind of expectations I have to live up to. And I'm trying to do the same thing for you as a student. What have, what have I set up as the large informing goals of this class? Why have I set up these goals? In a class like my survey, with mainly non-majors, how do those goals that I've set up serve you regardless of your major? How are they serving the end, point, the end goals of general education? Not just here at USU, but in other gen ed programs throughout the United States, just in case you happen to transfer. You want to tell your students that you've reflected on this. And, and I know from the comments students have given me, it's very meaningful to them that an instructor makes this effort. That someone is trying to clarify for a student what kind of learning we want them to achieve and what kind of pathways we can set up for them to actually achieve those goals. Um, but this takes just a lot of quiet reflection on your part, and it forces every one of you to dig deeply into your disciplinary expertise. Norm can give you, Norm, the university, um, Lee and, and the Gen Ed Committee now, can give you guidance on what these larger programmatic goals are. You should be in a conversation with colleagues in your department about what your disciplinary outcomes are. And the rubric is an opportunity not just to have a more valuable and meaningful conversation between teacher and student, but among your colleagues as well. What your discipline is trying to achieve, what you set up as your goals. And it's a great tool in the future for answering the next logical question. How do we know students are achieving the goals we set out? And that's a workshop for another day. And this is tough enough. Um, I came to it, Norm knows this, I came to it as pretty resistant, and thinking I didn't know anything about rubrics, when in fact, I, I, I figured this out after just two years of doing teaching at another land-grant university at Purdue in huge history survey classes and getting frustrated with my initial grading of student work and figuring out some kind of alternative that could help me keep my sanity and help students do better in their work. Uh, I think you call that a win-win situation. 
Um, folks, as you, as you look at this material, and again, I know there, there are only some historians in the room, some people from the humanities. I'm very curious if this kind of general outline is meaningful to people outside of the humanities itself. Can you conceive of the way in which your particular disciplines can draw on, on a resource like a rubric uh, in, your in the work that you do with your classes? Does it seem like a meaningful uh, exercise to engage in and a useful tool? And Because I, I honestly, I don't know. I usually just talk to people in the humanities. And this is a great opportunity to see a, an audience from across campus. Um, I also want to let you know that this, this slide set will be available, and um, we've added some of the some great resources here. What I like about this list of resources is that, especially from Cornell and from the University of Delaware, uh, they purposely move throughout all the, the disciplinary fields of major Research One universities to give you an idea of. The work that's already been done in your field. Uh, maybe there's little need to reinvent a rubric or to just cook it up out of whole cloth. Maybe you can find models on these different websites, and I strongly recommend Cornell's. They have a great center of teaching and learning on their campus. And there's, there's a lot of information on that website uh, that can guide you into your particular disciplinary area. Um, and to be frank with you, that, that the rubric you see in front of you, uh, that came from uh, North Carolina State University in uh, Raleigh. Uh, it was a great one that their history department had written up. And I took it, and it, uh, well, it's expanded now quite a bit. And I've developed it with my own language. But they gave me the head start, how to figure out the wording of this, what I should be looking for. And I'll be the first to admit, this will probably be of no help to anybody outside of history. But there are other resources available to you. These websites list them. And I think you're bound to find your area of disciplinary expertise um, somewhere in this listing of rubrics. Um, maybe that's what would help you overcome some resistance or uh, impatience or uh, just a sense of inability with this kind of tool. It did for me. Um, I wasn't very skilled at this at all. And just seeing what some colleagues in my field did it just helped me. Uh, it acted like a springboard. It cleared up a lot of questions. And just sitting, looking at this for a couple of days, I was able to sort out this kind of, uh, this kind of outline. I also want to just reiterate one other point. Looking at the questions that Norm and I uh, cooked up on this DQP sheet. This DQP, uh, sorry about the acronym. It's a program that's, that we should know about because it's, it parallels our degree profile here at USU. It stands for Degree Qualifications Profile. Regardless of the major of a student, what should they know, understand, and be able to do at different degree levels? Associate degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree. Regardless of major, what should students know, understand, be able to do? And the people behind this project uh, were quite willing to take up this publication because it was the kind of issue that fed right into the heart of their project. But it may feed right into the heart of your own teaching assignments, especially if you're doing gen ed survey classes, those 1,000 level classes. And I think the questions that we've outlined at the front are very easy to overlook, but they can make all the difference in the world when you think about how you want to approach that large group of students you have in front of you and how you want to frame your remarks for them. What will be most meaningful and helpful to them? Uh, and, and, and just telling you from my own experience and from student responses to the questions I've asked about these rubrics, the students have been so enthusiastic about these as a useful guide to help them understand how to direct their work in a class. 
Uh, I'll tell you frankly too, there are always a few students who make a very clear and meaningful objection to the rubrics. They think it stifles them, that it forces them into too narrow a way of thinking about learning. And I can't help but agree with them. They're the 1%. I have an obligation at a land grant university to keep my eye on the 99% in my classroom who are having difficulty with the foundational level skills of learning in higher education. And I'm willing to go ahead with this project for their interest. I know there's going to be a bunch who don't need this at all in my class, a bunch of students. I've got to keep my eyes on most of them, especially in, in working in large survey classes. Um, we know the debt that those students are running into, the cost of failure. And we also know something else. If they get into one of our classes and it turns out not to work, work out for them, where the hell else are they going to go? What other three credits are they going to find that are going to contribute to their graduation requirements? I, I think we've got to think of the kind of moral obligation we have to these students and the, sp the specific kinds of economic issues they're facing today and the limits they have in their choices in courses. When they enter that classroom, I think our goal is to keep them in that class and convince them, however skeptical they are, about the value of this course for their learning in general. And, uh, and honest to goodness, no one understands this better than historians. Uh, students just hate coming into our classes because of these bad memories they have from high school about history. Part of our job is shifting their thinking. And I think we do that in a great, we do that in a useful way. We do a great service to the students by t with tools like these rubrics. Um, but after all these introductory comments, at the end, the only thing I can say to you is that I have to turn this back to you and your disciplinary expertise, your choices, what you know your department is looking for in the course, the course or the courses that you're offering. Um, I can't fill in those tables for you. I urge you, if you're, if you're still if this is still something of a mystery to you, how you approach this kind of project, I urge you to take a look at some of these websites and to just start scouring through them to see where your discipline shows up. And look through examples that your colleagues have offered. Norm and I know that there was, last week, there was a session on rubrics by a dot-com place. And they were charging $500 for this one hour. Not only do we fail to charge you anything, you get cookies. <laughs> um, the other thing you should feel confident about, when you see rubrics posted from other EDU sources, you should feel free to take them. I can almost guarantee you, the colleagues who have written those up are not going to be disturbed if you take and revise and modify them for your purposes. Uh, no, Norm and I and colleagues have always done that here. This is our public property, not some private intellectual property. Yeah, John, will, will this PowerPoint be available? And put pressure on your professional disciplinary society to get involved with this kind of work. We're lucky to have the American Historical Association front and center in this project. The National Communications Association deeply involved in this work. Your disciplinary societies should be taking up this challenge and helping colleagues in your disciplinary field 
with these kinds of questions. Um, uh, think of that as another job of advocacy you can do in attending those annual conferences. Um, it's, it's work that every society should be engaged in. To own this kind of accountability and assessment in each discipline.